Auto home, push, push, flat out. Magic pad along. Two laps remaining, strategy 22. Let's go get him. Driving a Formula E car fast is one thing, and that's hard enough. But like in every other motorsport, there's much more than that that's needed. You need a team of experts and engineers, intense preparation, data crunching, and a strategy that can maximize your efforts and outperform your competitors. But in a series like this, with 45 minute races, no pit stops, and one type of tire that can last the entire race, what does that strategy look like in Formula E? I'm Saunders CB, and this is Formula E Explained. Electric racing is a whole new kind of motorsport. There are, of course, some familiarities, but there are also some unique factors that had to be developed from the ground up. Formula E strategy required a whole new way of thinking. The work starts long before the cars hit the circuit at the team's headquarters in the simulator. Incredibly advanced machinery and software gives the teams and drivers the ability to not just learn the circuits, braking points and so on, but also to simulate different car setups for different strategies and energy management scenarios. You get to the track and you're already tuned into how tight some of the corners are, what speeds to run, how hard to brake, you know, you've got a really good understanding. With the simulator, the drivers get a real feel and view for what the circuit's going to be like, but also they develop all the strategies, how they're going to use that 52 kilowatt hours of energy. To make it super simple, they give us a battery that lasts 40 laps, and maybe the race is 45 laps, so it's up to us to manage that battery. Where they actually lift off to conserve energy, recuperate energy going into the corners, and how they do that with their engineers. All of this is done before they even get to the circuit on the simulator. The track walk, which usually takes place on the day before a race, is the teams and drivers' first real opportunity to get out on track and have a look. And it's a great place to really correlate that data from the sim into the real world environment. Because there are a number of things that can't be simulated. Things like bumps or changes to the surface, which both play a part in the team's prep and strategy for the entire race day. Qualifying is, of course, a very crucial part of any race strategy. It dictates where you start the race, but there is a little bit more to it than that. It's one of the most challenging aspects of Formula E racing. One full power opportunity to drive as near to a perfect lap as possible, to hopefully top your group and then get the chance to do it all again with five others in Super Bowl. And the qualifying group you're in massively affects how easy it is to do that. Track evolution is a huge characteristic of street circuits. The idea being that as more cars drive the track, forge and clean the racing line, the grip improves. And with better grip comes faster lap times. But how is strategy used to improve the driver's chances of qualifying well? Strategy for the group one qualifying is always a very tricky one because there is a lot of track evolution. So it is actually very important to almost be the last car over the line because if you have five cars in front, it means that the track is kind of cleaning up for you. It's getting in a better condition, which means a faster lap time at the end as well. Last out in the group always gives you the best chance, but it's a high risk because you may not make it over the line in time to be able to start your lap. Remember Riyadh, we know that to our penalty. I think Roland might just make it because the timing beat me does. And Evans and Rast don't. They missed it. They missed it by just a, a tenth, but it's very, very frustrating. The choice of timing and when to send the car out on track to qualify also comes into the team's strategy. And the teams that top the standings in the season before can use their favorable pit lane position to their advantage. How? Antonio Felix da Costa. A demonstration, if you will. All right, guys, let me guide you through this one. So basically, we're in a very fortunate position to be the first car in the, in the pit lane. So for us, this is very good because we get the other cars coming down the pit lane and we can actually keep an eye on them. So basically what we do is we try and let one or two guys pass to try and be the third one on track. So we don't open the track for the other guys, but we're also not the last one and not, and not get caught up in any qualifying mess that we, we don't need. Obviously that's easier said than done, but anyway, you didn't hear that from me. Race strategy in Formula E is all about energy management. Pushing hard, getting out in front, hitting those energy targets, but making sure to save enough to make the end of the race. But only just. Often described as playing chess at more than 250 kilometers per hour. 
Teams dictate their race strategy and targets based on their grid position. Complex computer software will run different race star outcomes, including any track and ambient temperature changes and the relative pace and energy efficiency of their competitors. Now that data allows for them to create multiple strategy plans, a plan A, B and C if you like, to react to any developments or incidents on track. Safety car, safety car. So the race starts and that same software is used to start predicting the number of laps likely to be completed in the 45 minutes plus one lap of racing based on race pace, something that can of course change with any safety cars, yellow and red flags, and the usable energy that's deducted from the cars based on the duration of any caution period. One kilowatt hour for every minute under safety car or stoppage period. So how do the strategies differ? During a race, you really have to pick your fights because you don't have enough battery to fight everyone that you encounter. And people might be on different strategies. Some guys like to attack at the beginning and then they'll have a, a more difficult end to their race. I can see the dragon already going flat out, mate. <laughs> pick your fights properly. For me, it's really the kind of race that it's only over when it's over. If you start at the front, you can really dictate the pace. You know, obviously you try and go as fast as you can, but you can be way more efficient. You're only looking ahead. If you're in the middle of the pack, it's really what we call here in Formula with the other drivers, it's like World War III. It really hits the fan and, and it's fighting, defending, attacking, and you consume a lot of energy, so it's not very productive, but sometimes track position is also important. And if you're at the back, what do you do? Do you attack at the beginning, but then you use a lot of energy? Or do you just sit there and wait and be patient and patient and hope something comes to you? To be honest, patience is not a racing driver's virtue. I can tell you that. However, sometimes it's the thing you have to do, especially if you start back there. But of course, things don't always go to plan, more often than not in this championship. So what do you do when that original strategy goes right out the window? Puncture on the rear right. Box this lap. A very good friend of mine who was in the army, he said, when you sit down and you make your first strategy, you know for sure it isn't gonna work because one of the other factors that you cannot control comes into play. This is exactly the same. We can only control our two cars. We can't control the other 22 cars. And so from that point of view, we have our strategy, but we have to be adaptable and react to what other people are doing all the time. Get friends and follow Bird. Same energy than cars around. It doesn't mean that when you're starting on pole position, you're gonna, you're gonna be leading the race all the time. So you gotta keep your options open, have plan A, B and C ready in case uh, anything happens in the race. Real-time simulations are run on software during the race, adapting the strategy based on the events from energy use data and driver feedback. This presents itself in the form of radio messages to the drivers, giving them energy targets, how much energy they can use per lap based on the strategy and what's going on around them. Okay, what do we do with the Costa? Same energy as him, we look forward. Sometimes the direction will be to consume more energy to make an overtake or build a gap. Other times it'll be to save energy earlier so they can race right up until the checkered flag. Your pace is maybe a little bit fast for the moment and you don't save enough energy compared to Tonio. Now there's a regulated amount of energy that can be used in a race and to maximize their opportunities, teams want to finish the race on 0.0% of that usable energy, which based on any miscalculations or drivers exceeding their energy targets can mean having to coast over the line to avoid a penalty, which can be the difference between victory and defeat. So how is this constantly evolving information communicated between driver and team when only a certain amount of live data is available in the garage? Back there, we have a big crew of smart engineers, way smarter than me, that help me plan my race, even as the race is already going on. You know, they can see how much energy I have, they can see how much energy the other cars have, and we keep an open dialogue and they keep helping me with, is the right time to attack or not? Should we defend this from this guy? Should we pick this fight or not? So I, I get the help of these smart engineers back there to try and help me uh, drive my race. If you guys follow the radios between the drivers and, and the teams, you'll be hearing me say things like One Tango, Juliet Golf, Echo Zero, Tango Zero, Yankee 640. Uh, which even I don't know what it means, but they can encrypt that message back there and then they have all the information that they need to know. if if I'm on the correct lap until the end of the race, how much time is left, how much energy I have. And through that message and through the radio, uh, I pass that message and they give me back some feedback on how I'm doing and 
how to, to drive the rest of my race. Strat 8, Strat 8. It's not easy to uh, constantly give them the information whilst we're driving. There is uh, never a time of relaxing in Formula E. The straights are usually very short, so we've not got a lot of uh, thinking time and yeah, requires a lot of attention to details. When I'm in the car, firstly I have beeps in my ears, different tones of beeps which indicate whether to coast or to use the regen paddle. If you react slowly or quickly to those beeps, that, can, that will affect your, your speed in those different areas of the track. We've, we've got an energy bar to keep us updated throughout the lap of how we are doing on, on energy consumption relative to the expected energy consumption. So I've got a constant live update uh, of feedback. So it's not easy to look at the steering wheel, race the other 20 guys. People say men are not good at multitasking, but I think it's, this proves that we are. An additional factor within strategy in a race that has to be considered is of course attack mode. That being the high power mode that's activated by driving offline through these sensors, losing time and has to be used multiple times a race. Get it right and it can be a fundamental part of a good strategy. Get it wrong, it can be disastrous. A perfect attack mode strategy. You're just there with someone behind you. You manage to get into the attack mode, get the extra power and you're back out and still ahead. And then you've got a free time of normally four minutes to be able to pull away. And you know you've still got track position, you haven't had to use energy to overtake, and you haven't lost any time. You're just on a pure game. A bad one? Well, there's two bad ones. The first one is when you go in there and you miss it. He hasn't actually hit it there, Lucas de Grassi. Did you stay probably too wide on the right-hand side? And so you don't get all of the loops, and then you've lost the time of going in there, but you haven't got the extra power that uh, allows you to come back at them. And the second one is where you go in and you just kind of lose too many positions. Brandy's going for it. Attack mode. Can he hold the position? Oh, no, he's he's missed missed the ball. Ball. And through goes De Grassi into second place. And on a circuit where you can't overtake very easily, that is positions that are lost. And then you've got to wait until the person in front does their attack mode to try and get it back. The strategy always changes depending on where the attack mode is positioned. On some circuits we lose a lot of lap time, on some circuits we don't lose a lot of lap time, and that has a big influence on our strategy depending on how many positions we are going to lose, how easy it is to overtake on a certain circuit. We've got a fairly short period, especially on the longer tracks, where we can use the attack mode because you don't want to leave it too late because there's a rule where if you finish the race with either an attack mode to take or you're still in attack mode and you haven't used up all of your attack time, then you get a penalty. Leaving it to the last sort of five, six laps is pretty sketchy. It's a, it can be high risk and it can pay off, but you're, you're running the risk of, if there's a late race safety car, getting a penalty. So then you, you're, you're pretty much stuck with, you know, a quarter of the way into the race through to five, six laps from the end where you need to activate the two or sometimes three attack modes that we get allocated. Textbook race strategy comes from A, conserving more energy than the rest, sitting behind them, waiting, 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 and then at the end, pouncing when you've got more energy on those last few laps, or using the attack mode, the old undercut, where basically you will try to get the attack mode and then catch back up, and when the other person needs to take it to try to counteract, then you get track position, because you've been going faster with those extra kilowatts of power while they've been running around trying to defend from you. However, if you're in the front, you're always looking in the mirror because you don't want always to be the first person to take it. So it is a little bit of a gamble at that time and that's something that the engineers here are looking at with the overview of the strategy for the drivers. Drivers, to some extent, they just have to deliver what the engineers tell them. Success in Formula E requires near perfect driving and zero issues for the driver behind the wheel. But without the strategy, without the preparation, the constant calculations from the team, race wins and championship titles would not be possible. When the grid is this tight and the margins are this small, every single minute detail and micro adjustments can be the difference between victory or defeat. Formula E strategy explained.